Did you ever find the the car, the white Cadillac? I believe it was a rental car. Did you ever track it down through VIN number or anything to see if there's any forensics on that car? No, unfortunately, I think that's an area that maybe the ball got dropped on Las Vegas's part. By the time we came onto the scene, you know, we're 10 years after the fact. So to go back and try to get records on a rental car from 10 years, those don't exist. They're purged out of the system. So it's impossible then to know, because that car might be sitting in someone's backyard or it might be in the junkyard, you know? Now, yeah. Now, these days, yeah, that's, that was a long time ago. Did nobody have no license plate number or nothing to find that car? The first person that seen that car was me at the 662. You saw the white Cadillac. Yeah, they was there. Yeah, they was there. And... Being chased and all of that, and wasn't nobody thinking about getting no license plate number. But since it was a rental car, it would be, it seemed to be a, a car that would be easily but tracked. But who name, but you got to know who name it is. That was, that was, that's pretty much hard though, Alex. There was some information that probably could have been followed up on better. It was that the driver of that car, a guy named Terrence Brown, they called him Bubble Up. Um, T. Brown, his mom, it could have. It was either his mother or his mother-in-law, was the one who actually had rented the car over at the Enterprise at LAX, mm. and so if we had known that, or if law enforcement had known that back at the time, potentially they could have run down that lead and found out that there was a connection between T. Brown and the car. That would have been monumental. But even still, for y'all records today. Can y'all go back and look and see if that was a white Cadillac, whatever color it was, to make the model the whole nine? Yeah, no, because all those records were purged. You know, those rental car companies, after a period of time, they just purge their records. They don't keep them indefinitely for, you know, two decades. Yeah, but Enterprise, for example, takes all their cars that are like a two years old and they put them on an Enterprise lot mm -hmm. and then they sell them right. to the public. Right. They, those records still exist because they have to track... Who'd you sell it to? You had to put insurance on the car. There has to be a payment plan, so that means it was financed. So there's got to be records on I, these I guess cars. To, the point I'm trying to make is that first you'd have to go to a rental or to Enterprise and say, here's a name. That's purged. So if you were to go to them and say, hey, 20 years ago, they'd be, we don't have those records of Mrs. Brown. And that's the only way where you're going to be able to track the car because through her name is she the only... basically is all lost. How about this? You have... Well, you've learned about this in 2006, 2007, right? 2009, 2009. really. 2009, okay. Yeah. So 13 years later, you, you know that they rented a car from Enterprise, mm -hmm. a white Cadillac, a mm -hmm. 96 Cadillac. Mm -hmm. How many of them could there have been? And they have records of all the VIN numbers. They probably don't have a record of who rented it, right? but the identity of the car should still be recorded somewhere, right? With the VIN number and the license plate. Yeah, theoretically, you're right. Uh, that that. Well, even if they got the car, I mean, 13 years later, you ain't going to get nothing off of it. Well, apparently, they got shot back at. I'm just, I'm just looking at it as a piece of evidence that was never looked at. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, okay, so let's say that you were able to do that from a practical standpoint. Let's say you identified the car and it still exists and you could go recover it. That connects you to Terrence Brown, right, who's dead. Connects you to Keefe D by way of, you know, his own confession of saying he's in that car. So what does that actually do as far as a potential prosecution? What's the value of that knowledge or that evidence today? It's too late. Yeah. Well, in 2006, what, what year did Terrence Brown get killed? He died in, uh, I, it was... Just a few years ago, really. Yeah, he was still alive. When, he was still when alive. When our task force started. That's correct. Yeah, so that's correct. And I'll just concede to the fact that that effort wasn't made. Okay. Yeah. Let's get to some of uh, Reggie's points that he wanted you to cover. I guess this first one, um, Gene Deal been doing a lot of talking on this case lately. Oh, man, I've seen that guy. <laughs> and I'm, I really don't want to want to even comment on that cat because I don't know him. He uh, said some shit. I, don't, I ain't never seen this dude. I don't care nothing about this. You live in New York. What, the f what is you talking about? Uh, Reggie and James. So you said that? He said this a couple of months ago. But I, I'm not going to even reply to that because you don't know me to say that. 
if that's how you feel, I mean, Gene Deal can come to Gangster Chronicles and sit down and we can talk. He can bring his people, but after the fact, we can move this table and Gene Deal handle his business. <laughs> that's the only way he can talk to me and talk. I don't want to hear that shit. I ain't finna be no studio gangster. I ain't finna be talking from Gangster Chronicles to your little ragged ass podcast or whatever you're doing on your couch and, and, and just go back and forth. I'm not finna do none of that shit. But yeah, he been talking. <clears throat> so I went and looked up uh, Gene Deal and Mace. And the video I watched that Mace got on this video and was telling him, y'all had guns too. Why y'all didn't shoot at the cat that shot Biggie? They actually sat there and watched Biggie get shot. Nobody don't know that. But Mace put it out there. Y'all had guns, y'all the security. Why y'all didn't shoot this dude? Well, I don't know, but for anyone who's 45 and under, they don't know who Mace is, but Mace was one of the top rappers on Bad Boy Records in the uh, early 90s. I think he was actually on before Biggie was on, but um, I guess um, Gene Deal was present when Biggie got killed. Yeah, he was there. Gene Deal was the bodyguard for Bad Boy for Puff, so even though I know you don't want to hear nothing he got to say... Um, <coughs> Do you think he has any value, Greg, of being present and what his story is? Of course. You know, whatever his observations were that night need to be um, taken into consideration. You know, he did have this encounter or, you know, kind of a soft encounter uh, with an, a guy that he perceived um, as a nation of Islam. In his original statement, when his, he said, yeah, he was dressed like a guy from a nation of Islam, but I don't think he was because he wasn't acting like one. I don't know what that means. I don't know what a nation of Islam guy acts like that's any different than the next guy who might be standing there with a bow tie. So I'm not sure exactly what that means, but that was his statement. I don't think he was a real NOI because of the way that he was acting. But he says a guy in a bow tie came walking up, looked suspicious. And you have to keep in mind that the previous night there was a confrontation with some guys from the Nation of Islam and Bad Boy at the uh, Shrine Auditorium. So that's already in his mind as a bodyguard, as a security guy looking for threats. They've already had an encounter. He sees a guy, makes him uncomfortable, and then that individual kind of looks over at him and then turns around and walks up the street in the direction of where the shooting will ultimately take place. So yeah, that's great information. That's important information to know. But what ends up happening is over time, that story continues to just evolve and change. And that's where it becomes problematic. You know, we have his original interview and we retained everything he said. It's all recorded. And the things that he's saying now and has been saying are not consistent with what he originally said. And so you've got to ask yourself, well, then what's the motivation? Why are things changing? Is it just to stay relevant? Is it to be sensational? Is it to get clicks? You know, because your story shouldn't be changing that much. Well, didn't Lil C's, Lil Caesar, who was part of the the Biggie camp, didn't he say something similar about a guy from the Nation of Islam? And I think this kind of promotes the Harry Billups theory, sure. the Amir Muhammad theory. Because to this day, Gene Deal believes Amir Muhammad was the shooter. Am I right about that? Uh, well, I'm not exactly sure if he truly believes that. He's kind of committed to it now because of the fact that he identified him and said it's the shooter. So he's never going to change that regardless of the evidence that, you know, works against that that thought. Um, but there may be some legitimacy to the idea that a Nation of Islam guy, real or not real, um, was somehow involved in what took place. I don't think that Pucci would have been in a, in a position if he's sitting in his car to know exactly where Biggie was sitting. So maybe Pucci had a lookout. Maybe somebody was spotting. And so I can't discount that. All I can tell you with absolute confidence is that that guy that he saw from the Nation of Islam was not Amir Mohammed. But last night you did say that both shootings, the Pac and Biggie, have conspirators. The theory that Pooch was alone in that car when he shot Biggie, but you believe they're conspirators in the Poochie shooting. It makes the most sense to think there's at least one other um, co-conspirator, that somebody else may have been out on foot and said, okay, listen, we're watching. Because you got to keep in mind that it took a while for them to get in their cars and to get out onto the street and to pull away. Somebody would have had to been in a position to say, hey, it's the second Suburban, Big's in the right front seat. 
So, you know, because Pucci's not going to be in a position to go into the parking lot, see where they're at, then run, get his car, get back out on the street and be in a position to do what he did. So it would make the most sense that there is probably some communication between the car and somebody out there watching, watching directly where Big is at. Are the, there's a little bit of video tape from somebody that mm-hmm. was standing across the street from the Peterson Museum. I don't know, it's like 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Yeah. Was that video useful at all? I mean, you could hear the number of shots, mm-hmm. but other than that, was it useful? Well, it was because it, it, it showed, for one, the kind of mayhem that was going on around there. You saw the amount of people going on and all of the activity. You see um, Puffy pull out of the parking lot, and they're just kind of posted up for a minute out in the middle of the street waiting for Biggie's Suburban to pull up behind them. So you capture all of this. And so you can see clearly where Puffy's at in the in the car. You can see where his driver's at. And then you see where the shooting takes place, which is right there at the corner, because they keep the video rolling as everybody's jumping out of their cars, running over to Big and trying to attend to him. So yeah, there's value in it for sure. Every piece of information is potentially valuable. Okay, is Gene Deal saying that he saw Amir Muhammad shoot Puppy? Mm. I mean, Biggie? No, Gene's not saying that. Gene's saying that the guy that he saw that walked up and caused him to, um, you know, caused him to take note is Amir Muhammad. So why they putting him out there like he's a killer, Amir Muhammad? Why they putting him out there like a killer if nobody said he was the driver, the man that pulled up and mm-hmm. popped nine times because I know ain't nobody in that car mm-hmm. look their head up and say, oh, that was him. I, oh, yeah, I know him from a T. Why them shots was going. So how is they, they paint him to be the killer? So circumstantially, what ends up happening is little Cease, who's in the best position to actually see the shooter, he's right behind Biggie in the rear passenger seat. So that Impala would have pulled right up alongside. So the shooting takes place, and Little C says, shit, I, I ducked like anybody would. But there was that moment when I looked over and I glimpsed at the shooter, and he was wearing Nation of Islam type of attire. You need a reenactment of that, because you're a cold cat to sit up and, and look at somebody that's dumping on you. Well, I've been in that situation many times, and I'm not finna keep my head up to see who's shooting at me. Yeah, so it might have been if, if, you know, if we just take this, if, if we do reenact this in our minds and imagine that you're sitting in the backseat of that Suburban and you happen to look over and the shooting hasn't taken place yet, but you just happen to notice the car pulling up alongside of you and you see a guy in a suit and then the gun comes out and then you duck. So there's, there's a plausible um, reality that maybe, maybe he saw what he said he saw. Yeah, I mean, that would be... Two seconds, maybe? Mm-hmm. Just two seconds. Yeah. Is that enough to get a glimpse of somebody and send them to prison for the rest of their life? No, but no. how often does a few seconds of eyewitness testimony help land a conviction? It don't. It does. People get convicted on uh, Oh, I just had a glimpse of me? Yeah. Well, that in, that in consideration with other information, yeah. you know, because you've got... Well, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Um, so you have him go in Little C's in, in G Money, Gregory Young, who was the driver of Biggie's car. Um, they go and sit down with a forensic um, uh, artist and they draft up a couple of composites. Well, you look at these composites and, you know, you can see what you want to see. You know, but they could be, there's a lot of people could look like these guys because the two composites don't necessarily even look alike. So that's problematic in itself. One of them does look like Harry Billups. Exactly. I looked at them. And and whoever did that composite didn't know anything about Harry Billups or Muhammad. So is it just a coincidence that Lil C's, Gene Deal, whoever gave the information to the artist, Mm -hmm. is this a coincidence? Mm -hmm. Nah, it's the the shape of his head. All black men look alike. Nah, there's there's a a resemblance. We all got a twin. Well, so this becomes even more difficult because the way that this individual is described by Eugene Deal does not match the individual that Little C saw. So their descriptions aren't consistent. So now you're like, okay, well, Eugene Deal believes that this guy that walked up is the, is, was potentially the shooter and identifies Amir Mohammed, right? Well, in their descriptions, they're not consistent. So you have to take all these things into consideration and try to work through 
You know, how do, how do people's impressions affect it? How's the lighting? How quick this took place? And the best thing to actually do um, as an investigator is to sit and listen to these guys talk, not just take um, the written statements like, hey, he said he looked 24 to 25, uh, a grayish to maybe light suit. When you listen to their actual interview tapes and you hear their voices, you get a very clear impression that they didn't see anything. Exactly, because <laughs> yeah. for number one, Gene Deal is given a description of a man that he saw standing by, not of the shooter. What difference does, do that make? And then once again, his his uh, sketch is is totally different from the picture that the other guy did. You know his description. So what is his purpose? You feel me? I and mean, everybody just yeah. Like, so Eugene Deal. I'm sorry to cut yeah, you off, but ahead. since we were here talking about Eugene Deal, uh, after you know the investigators had interviewed him several times, they took a six pack, a, a photo lineup to him, and displayed that and. He picked out a guy in one of the positions that investigators knew had absolutely just some random guy, had nothing to do at all with this murder. But Eugene Deal says, yeah, that's, that's what the guy looked like. And so now you've got at least what Eugene Deal's impression of that individual was. That guy looks nothing like Amir Mohammed. So then down the road, years later, Eugene Deal sees a picture of Amir Mohammed and says, that's the guy. Well, if that's the guy, why does he look so much different than the original guy that you said looked like him? And then you find out that Eugene Deal saw a picture of Mir Mohammed in XL magazine prior to seeing him in this photographic lineup. 